Manoj, Manoj has been the key anchor for our retreats. In the self-awareness course, once a semester, we go to Auroville and he conducts a full day workshop there. And in the Integral Karma Yoga course, we make another trip to Pondicherry proper and he conducts the day-long workshop here. Manoj has also helped us with the SAGE courses, Self-Awareness and Higher Goals in Education. It's a five to six day program we hold once every year in IIT Madras for college teachers. So, uh, I don't want to say anything more except to say that uh, you'll find an authentic person in Manoj Pavitran. Please take this <coughs> seriously. Ask whatever questions you have. And now hand over the, the date to Manoj. He's uh, worked out the schedule. He'll also explain how we'll go about doing it. Um, Feel free. Hmm? Welcome. Thank you for coming all the way from Chennai. Today we will uh, <coughs> have this morning session till 12. Then we will go to Ashram Dining Hall for lunch. Come back here 1 o'clock. In the second session till 3. And a small break after and then third session till 5 then we will be going to the Samadhi of Sri Aurobindo. After that back to the dining hall for dinner. That's the program for the day. I would like to start with uh, your course title Integral. For you What is integral? Why is it integral? The, uh, something which can go along with our daily lives or uh, in, uh, which we can include in and make it a par uh, part and parcel of our lives. That Dictated is, with the daily life. Yeah. Not something separate. So. Anyone else? Other perspectives? We have Karma Yoga, right? Word is well known. Karma Yoga is very well known. Word, why integral Karma Yoga? What makes it integral? Did you ask this question? Sir, uh, it can mean that uh, in, like, all parts of your being are uh, being put into this, like all parts of yourself. Yeah. All parts of our being are in it. Yeah. yeah. Any, anyone else? Let me ask another question. Uh, this word integral applied in this context. When did it start? Who started it? Any idea? No. Sorry? Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda, he has used the word? Guessing. <laughs> okay. Any more guesses? Sri Krishna, in English, integral. It's relatively new. The term is relatively new, applied in this context. Because in India, we had been using the word Karma Yoga for a long time. But the use of the word integral emerged last century. And uh, 
here is the man who started it all. You know him? Who is he? That's Lord Minto saying, I can only repeat that he is the most dangerous man we now have to reckon with. And this photograph was taken in the jail. You know why? You have learned Indian history? What, what, did, what do you know about him in Indian history? Part of the Sudeshi movement. What else? Why is he such a most dangerous man? What made him so dangerous? Revolutionary. Sudeshi movement. But is it there in our history books? Do you really find him in our history book? How much how many paragraphs are given to him? <laughs> Three lines? That is the reality of our history books. And it is about a man whom British government considered as the most dangerous man. And he is the one who started off integral, the usage of the term. And that is the interesting part for us here. And I want to take today's journey. It is more of a storytelling. It is not a workshop. Please feel free to raise your hand anytime if you have questions. And feel free to ask questions. I need questions. I need active engagement from you. It is part history, part our integral karma yoga, all woven together. So, let us find out what made him so dangerous. The typical photograph they take when you are get arrested, one front profile and one side profile and it is from the police records. He was put in the jail between 1908 and 9, one year from May to May. And there something happened and this is what happened. The only result of the wrath of the British government was that I found God. You know about that? You heard about that in the history books? You have heard. Where did you study? And these things were there in the history book. We have some brief lines about it that he was in politics, revolutionary and then he left everything. And this was a very crucial year in his life when he was in the jail. And he is saying he found God in the jail. Strange, right? Being in the jail, something so profound happening. So, I want to go a little bit back in history. What happened? What was happening? That is his father, Dr. Kaidi Ghosh, 
and Sri Aurobindo says his father was really an atheist. He did his studies in England and when he came back he was a completely westernized man and he did not want anything to do with Indian culture. The western culture was so superior, he was so impressed. And Sri was born in 1972, August 15th. August 15th. Take note of the date. It's important in the learning of our history, our exploration of our history, because there are so many things we will not find in the history books. Fifth, August 15th, when India would get independence. So, what his father did was to send Sri very early to England for education, because he did not want his children to have anything to do with Indian culture. He wanted them to grow up in a pure western high culture. So, at the age of 7 he was sent and 14 years he would spend in England studying there and he did not even know his mother tongue. But when in India itself, he was put into uh, with missionaries where he was growing up with English. So, he was out there. This was a school, St. Paul's school, where he did his schooling. And he was learning the best of Western culture. Western literature, philosophy, culture and all the languages, Latin, Greek and all the old wisdom as well as the modern wisdom, everything that West could offer and he was learning there. And that was a total absorption in that culture and imbibing everything. And parallel to that, this was happening. Indian National Congress was formed in 1885. This too play a part in the story. It was in 1885, first meeting in Bombay, photograph is from there. So, this was happening when Sri was very young and he was there in England. And this was the college where he did his further studies, King's College. Cambridge and what happened during that period was the British atrocities in this country was getting really, really worse and his father was getting deeply disappointed with his admiration for everything British and Western and he was getting increasingly sad about the pain and the suffering that was happening to his countrymen. So, he used to send messages to his son about what is going on in India. And Sri Aurobindo was getting this sense that there is a great upheaval coming up in his country and he is going to play a major part in that transformation. And this was happening when he was in Cambridge and he returns to India in 1893. That is Apollo Bandar in Bombay, very old photo. And when he landed, like after 14 years, when he landed in India, he had a spontaneous spiritual experience, a vast peace settles in settles upon him, a very profound deep peace. That was his first experience of something extraordinary. It is as if the mother land was receiving her beloved child and it stayed with him. And this year, 1893 is very, very crucial in Indian history. 
you know why what are the other major incidents that took place during this year world religious congress yes that was the year swami vivekananda went to chicago something else happened that will eventually pull down the empire what happened went to south africa you are, we are getting closer <laughs> came back something happened in south africa launch the movement yeah exactly that's what happened gandhi was thrown out of a train and that sets the fire it was such an injustice he said this empire must end this injustice is not okay So in South Africa Gandhi was getting fired up and Swami Vivekananda was on his way to Chicago and that year he sets in motion whole lot of forces You know who is sitting right next to on the right side of Swami Vivekananda Tesla exactly they were very close tesla and swami so that 1893 was a very crucial year where many of these things were happening of which we know the chicago event as well as gandhi's incident return of shirobindo to india and this experience is not known it's with some minor incident but that's the year something profound was beginning to happen because even those work was largely spiritual and this was like the door was gently opening so keep that in mind 1893 and when he returned he started working with gaikwad of Baroda king the he joined the state service and here one of the thing he did was immersing back in indian culture he knew nothing about indian culture not a single indian language can you imagine he did not even know his mother tongue so he started learning everything from scratch self taught bengali sanskrit gujarati marathi and reading indian literature and he was a fast reader and he was deeply deeply immersing while he was doing the work for maharaja on one side he was deeply immersing in study of indian culture which he had no chance to know and all this languages related literature and that continued also at the same time another experience was waiting for him none of this he actually sought for it these things were happening spontaneously there was a carriage accident about to happen then he saw something from within him a being of light emerging and stopping the accident so he saw that there are things that are beyond the physical what we can we experience as our physical world and the physical reality. there was something beyond that was operational and it was acting through him but he had no clue what this was and he had written about it in a poetic form later that was his second spiritual experience in baroda
and the same time behind the scene he started writing political essays in a magazine called Indu Prakash and it was titled New Lamps for the Old. So what was happening at that time was Indian National Congress was already in place and they were beginning to talk about India getting a greater respect from the British crown. Not independence and freedom, but please consider us also as human beings, as you know, be a bit gentle with us. It was in that tone, whereas Sri Aurobindo stepped in and started writing, this is not okay. We can't just ask for such things. We should stand for freedom of the country. And the current leadership is not doing that. They are having no courage. We need to change the leadership. New lamps for the old. And he was very young, 21 years old. And he was asking for a large change, challenging the leadership of that time. And he was already seen as a black sheep. He is a bit too fiery, too demanding, too intimidating in his intensity and his demand. So that series of articles, he was quietly asked to stop. This is getting too much. This is going to create problem for the leaders. So please stop. So then he lost interest in those, in the Prakash magazine articles and he moved and that year 90, uh, 102, that was the year when Swami Vivekananda left his body. Swami Vivekananda will later play an important role in Sri Aurobindo's journey. I will come to that. But this was when Sri Aurobindo was leaving. No, uh, Swami Vivekananda was leaving. Another experience was waiting for him. This was in Kashmir, in the hills of Shankaracharya. There, he suddenly experienced some vast presence in nature, an impersonal vastness, a great presence behind what appears to be the nature. And it was another deep experience. All this came without him searching for any spiritual experience. It was not even called spiritual experience, an experience. And this was spontaneously happening. Then comes the turning point, 1904, where he saw the power of yoga. Till then he had no interest in yoga. He was looking for power to liberate his country. Then he came across this sadhu who took a cup full of water cut it crosswise with a knife while repeating a mantra. He then asked Barin. Barin is his, was his uh, brother who had a heavy mountain fever at that time and asked Barin to drink it saying he won't have fever the next day and the fever left him. And this was a big eye opener. So he saw that yoga can actually give power. So he wanted, if this can give power, then I want that. That's when he started actually practicing yoga. I thought that a yoga requires me to give up the world was not for me. Here comes integral yoga. We had this tradition in India, spiritual life and yoga which demanded kind of a withdrawal from life, an escape from life. You go to 
you become a renunciate, you go to forest, you go to mountains, you go to ashrams. For Sri this was not acceptable. And he found that I had to liberate my country. I took it up seriously when I learned that the same tapasya, that same yogic tapasya, which one does to get away from the world can be turned into action. This is where karma yoga is coming in. It, how turning that into action? And I learned that yoga gives power and I thought, why should I not get the power and use it to liberate my country? It was very simple, straightforward. I want to liberate my country and I want yogi power for that. And he starts in 1904. And he starts with pranayama. And he was intensely practicing. Four to six hours a day. Imagine, four to six hours a day. Such an intense will to do. And he was putting all that committed practice, very deep, intense practice. So that was the beginning of his actual practice of yoga. Another experience in 1905, as you know, with my Europeanized mind, I had no faith in image worship and I hardly believe in the presence of God. We have in our country particularly a wide range of image worship, all kinds of forms. And there is such a tremendous confusion with spirituality, religion, politics, everything is made into a potpourri. And he was an atheist. And he had no interest in this. But something happened when he looked at one of Kali's images in a temple. There was a living presence. And he was not looking for it. It just happened. There was a presence. So these were like the doors opening one after other naturally, spontaneously. You stand before a temple of Kali, beside a sacred river and see what? A sculpture, a gracious piece of architecture. But in a moment, mysteriously, unexpectedly, there is instead a presence, a power, a face, a face. Can you imagine? A face of the formless divinity are looking at you through a form, through a face that looks into your eyes and inner sight in you has regarded the world mother. That was first encounter with the presence of the world mother. So these were like experiences building up one after other, giving him insight into things that are way beyond the physical. And this were coming unexpectedly. So, in 1906, he left the Baroda service. Because till then, he was working behind. He had been organizing revolutionaries behind the work, behind the front layer. Because he was working with the king, he couldn't afford to be in front end in the Indian freedom movement. But from behind, he was organizing it. He was even training, taking the members to the military training and get them, you know, we have to take power in our hands to deal with atrocities that was happening. And in 1906, he decided, now it's done, I'm going full out into political action to awaken the country, to set 
the collective mind, the will to freedom. And he started writing in these newspapers. One was called Yugantar, other was called Vande Mataram. And this Vande Mataram become very, very important organ of political action at that time. You know from where this Vande Mataram comes? From where did it arise? This phrase. You must have heard, right? The song Vande Mataram. Banking Chandra Chatterjee. And the song was there, but it was Sri Aurobindo who saw that this phrase contains the power. It is a mantra to awaken the nation, the soul of the nation. And he called Banking Chandra Chatterjee for finding that mantra. He called him Rishi. And it was Sri Aurobindo took that out and put it right at the center of his political vision and action, going down to the mother. He saw a nation not as a piece of land, as a living embodiment of Divine Mother. And he was mobilizing. His words were carrying that intensity and power of conviction and clarity that was unheard of in Indian politics at that time. And he was setting in motion All the basic ideas that eventually become the cry of independence in the country. And he was the first one to declare in public that India must be free, absolute freedom, free from the British Empire. He was the first man to stand up and say. Now you begin to sense why he was the most dangerous man in British India at that time. He was setting the scene for the powers. He was set, setting in motion the forces that would eventually lead to India's freedom. And all these ideas of non-cooperation, passive resistance, so deshi, boycott, national education, all those ideas were set in motion. First of all, bringing into the collective mind, so that the collective mind understands, having a clarity, this is the direction to go. And he was one of the extremely popular leaders emerging within a very short time. Till then he was behind the scene. The moment he came out, it was fire. The country was set on fire. Indian National Congress. So the Congress was going very slow without having the courage to ask for the freedom. And then there was this nationalist movements who were revolutionaries who wanted absolute freedom and if necessary take power in your hands if you want to get freedom of, for this country. So there was intense conflict within Congress and Sri and Tilak Logmanya Tilak, they were pioneering that, leading that wing. And there was intense churning happening. This photograph is from 1907, one of the Congress meetings where Sri Aurobindo was chairing the meeting. So, there was, India was getting into turmoil at that time. And interestingly, that was the time this was happening to Sri Aurobindo that he had these two tracks happening. On one side, he was totally into politics, external action, very, very intense action in the external world. On other side, his spiritual exploration. So, remember, he was practicing pranayama since 1904 and he, it gave him a lot of energy, lot of poetic inspiration, but 
he came to stand still, things were not moving the way he expected it to go. And he wanted a breakthrough. And he was looking for a guide, a guru, someone who can guide him. And someone put him in touch with this man called Vishnu Bhaskar Lele, a Maharashtrian yogi. And Lele asked him, like, come with me for a few days. I want two of us to be in complete isolation. And Sherbindu takes off from his very hectic schedule and go with Lele in a house, they sit together. And Lele asked him, sit in meditation, but do not think. Look only at your mind. You will see thoughts coming into it. Before they can enter, throw these away from your mind, till your mind is capable of entire silence. That was the instruction. You know Patanjali's Yoga Sutra? How many of you have read Patanjali's Yoga Sutra? Not heard of? But not read. The first line of that Yoga Sutra is Adha Yoga Anushasanam Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha. That is the Chitta Vritti has to be brought to silence. And one of the Chitta Vritti is this unending thought that is happening. The strings of text that is you know, rolling through our mind all the time. Right now when you are sitting, there are all kinds of mental reactions that are happening, right? Thoughts are moving through your head. It's happening, right? It's, whether you like it or not, it's happening. And here is Lele telling him, thoughts come from outside. Look at it. Before they enter, reject it. And this was going to be a major turning point for Sri Aurobindo. That was the room where he was sitting in meditation. I saw one thought and then another coming in a concrete way from outside. I flung them away before they could enter and take hold of the brain and in three days I was free. In three days, he was free from the grip of thoughts. That is an extremely unusual thing to happen. You know how difficult it is to keep the mind quiet. How many of you have tried to keep your mind quiet? Fantastic. And how was the experience? Very difficult, right? Have you tried this? Have you looked at this? Have you ever thought that thoughts are coming from outside? Does it appear as if they are coming from outside? No. What about your mobile phone? From where does things come to the mobile phone? You hear the sound. From where does it come? From outside, right? There is a mobile tower transmitting and this is receiving. Imagine our mind is something like that. It is receiving, but we are not aware. We think I am thinking, right? Not only that I am thinking, I am the thought, right? Right or not? Now, we are so much identified with the thought. There is this transmission happening all the time. Some big towers are transmitting thoughts and we are happily carried by thoughts thinking that it is our thought. So, here he was making himself free just by looking at it very intensely. The ability to stand back from your thought, observe it and reject it. And in three days he was free and he had this experience of what traditionally known as Nirvana completely blanked out. The whole world is empty, void of its content. And that is a very high spiritual experience. Sizeive turn that was happening in his life at that time. And the funny thing is, 
he is going around giving talks across the country. The body continued indeed to see, walk, speak and do its other business, but as an empty automatic machine and nothing more. In the Gita, you must have heard this phrase Brahmastiti. Did you? Did you come across? Established in that inner poise. Here he was completely emptied out of all the content. And he was going around giving talks. When after this experience, he was to go and give talk in a large gathering. And he told Lele, look, I can't go and give a talk. There is nothing inside me. I am so totally blank, I can't give any talk. And Lele said, no, you just go, stand there, do pranams, and it will happen. Sri Aurobindo goes and stand in front of the crowd. Something flashes inside and he gives a speech. That was not premeditated, it just came. And he saw that then onwards, he could express what and when, whatever is required for any context was naturally flowing through. And he was also clear from then onwards that he can actually trust that inner divinity who is guiding him from then onwards. So, he was a walking, talking nirvana at that time. He was going around and setting the country on fire. All the reception, political reception that he was getting. You know, the greatest thing done in those years was the creation of a new spirit in the country, in the enthusiasm that swept surging everywhere with the cry of Vande Mataram ringing on all sides. Can you imagine that time when India was, this wave was rising up, Gandhi is still not there, Gandhi is in South Africa, he is fighting there. Here the whole energy wave was getting built up and that is when the Britishers found this is unbearable. This is going to be very, very dangerous. This man is dangerous, but how to catch him? There was no way, because all his writings were so perfect, they could not find ways to grab him. But there were many things happening. There were revolutionaries, extremists, all that were happening there. And Sri had multi-layered personality operating in various levels. And finally, he was arrested. There was something called Alipur bomb case, where uh, young revolutionaries tried to kill some British officer and it fails. And uh, immediately, the government machinery steps in, arresting Sri Aurobindo and a lot of young people. And that was like, the point where he was put into the jail and remember he was saying that the atrocity of government was that eventually he found God. That was happening here. And this room, this is where a solitary imprisonment was happening and he was alone in the cell. One year the court case went on. And it was in that jail, he had his intense practice of yoga. So, the realization we call the cosmic consciousness. In the jail, I had the Gita and the Upanishads with me. Practiced the yoga of the Gita and meditated with the help of the Upanishads. These were really the guiding books and he was connecting with the presence that was there and he was looking at if Krishna is there, I must know, where are you? 
I must find you. And here comes Swami Vivekananda and he was beginning to get high spiritual experiences where it is a fact that I was constantly the voice of Vivekananda speaking to me for a fortnight in the jail in my solitary meditation and felt his presence. Remember, Swami Vivekananda left in 1902 and this is happening in 1908 in the jail where Shirobindo was hearing his voice giving him many guidance on realization of higher planes of consciousness leading to the super mind he was already on his way in his meditations in the Alipur jail. That period in the jail was very crucial where he saw the greater issue at hand. Freedom of India was a small part of the story. There was something much, much vast, vaster that was happening on earth of which he is a part and what he referred to as supermind and its manifestation. We will come to it later, part of the story. Because this is part of that integral development. Nirvana is emptied of all the content, whereas the cosmic consciousness is a dynamic power that is presiding over the creation. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, that is what Sri says, his yoga often begins with where other yogas ends, like after nirvana what? So, we can take those things later, this is a very important question and there are various aspects to it that has created tremendous confusion in this country, everything is like partial truth. So, if we need an integral truth, we need to see these aspects. Actually, I would like to read out the experience of cosmic consciousness that he had. It is an incredible experience of what we call the immanent divine. He was saying, okay, before that, it was in the jail that the only result of the, bra of the wrath of the British government was that I found God. And this is what happened, where he is Right, he later describes what happened there. I looked at the jail that secluded me from men and it was no longer by its high walls that I was imprisoned. No, it was Vasudeva who surrounded me. I walked under the branches of the tree in front of my cell, but it was not the tree. I knew it was Vasudeva. It was Sri Krishna, whom I saw standing there and holding over me his shade. I looked at the bars of my cell, the very grating that did duty for a door and again I saw Vasudeva. It was Narayana who was guarding and standing sentry over me or I lay on the coarse blankets that were given me for a couch and felt the arms of Sri Krishna around me, the arms of my friend and lover. This was the first use of the deeper vision he gave me. I looked at the prisoners in the jail, the thieves, the murderers, the swindlers and as I looked at them, I saw Vasudeva. It was Narayana whom I found in these darkened souls and misused bodies. Imagine the experience of the entire reality around is nothing but the body and manifestations of the divine. There is an immanent, all pervasive, all pervading aspect of the divine. This is not the experience of Nirvana. 
Nirvana is where the reality around is empty. It is void of any reality. Whereas in this experience, it is the living presence of the divine indwelling divinity in all things and it is cosmic. It is in all things that are around. Every particle is with that presence. And that too is an experience. So, what has happened in Indian tradition is those who had the other experience concluded that that is the final. But there were people who had this experience who claimed this. Then there are yet other forms of experience. So, we had in the country various experiences and resultant confusions that which is what. These things were to be sorted out later. In the synthesis of yoga, what Sri Aurobindo does later, he brings together everything and shows the totality, the integral vision he shows. So, he had that nirvanic experience and later he is having this experience. And uh, right after the jail, he went to this, there was a reception in a place called Uttarpara, where he gave a famous speech. That is where he spoke about his experience, what happened in the jail. And imagine the state of the country at that time. It was a profound spiritual awakening. The renaissance in India was rising and the deep spiritual foundation. Remember, by the time Swami Vivekananda had already gone to Chicago and set things in motion all over. And Sister Nivedida was here and he, she was also working with Sri Aurobindo. When he was in the jail, she was looking into the newspapers. So, there was this intense action and the awakening of the country that was happening. And it had a very powerful spiritual foundation and the strong leaders like Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo, there were many others. It was a very, very intense time. And Gandhi was stirring up in South Africa. He had not yet come back to India. So, till then Sri Aurobindo did not really have that deep experience of God and it is that experience that changed him totally. When I approached God at that time, I hardly had a living faith in him. The agnostic was in me, the atheist was in me, the skeptic was in me and I was not absolutely sure there was a God at all. I did not feel his presence. But after that experience in the jail, it became a continuous presence and he would completely change afterwards. It was a decisive turn in his work. Plus what happened was he saw that freedom of India was just one of the steps. There was much greater issue at stake. What is happening in the world? What is happening to the earth? India's freedom was one of the steps on the way. We will come to it. So, he comes back from the jail and opens another newspaper, it is called Karma Yogin. Karma Yogin, remember. And here he gives the vision, the spiritual vision and the foundation of Karma Yoga and the action in the world and his vision. It was a very profound newspaper, people were waiting for the issue after issue to come. That intense awakening that was happening, this was one of the instruments of that journey. And the illustration on the cover was that of Sri Krishna and Arjuna seated in their chariot on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. And the two mottos on the top were, remember me and fight. That was not ordinary fight, remember me and fight. Yoga is skill in words. You must have heard about these two definitions of yoga. Na? Yoga, Chitta Vritti, Nirodha and Yoga, Karma, Kaushalam. One is from a Karma Yoga perspective, other is from a Raja Yoga perspective. 
Emilia, ask questions, okay? Stop me, otherwise I go on. The British government could not bear it, that this was going completely out of hand and they had to somehow or other get Sri Aurobindo arrested, he was the most dangerous man in the country and they were having all the plans and he got the message when he was in the Karma Yogin office, office would be searched and the next day and myself arrested. So, at that time, he is get, receiving the inner guidance, go to this place called Chandarnagar, that was in Bengal. So, he, by the time he had offered himself entirely to the process of yoga and to the divine guidance, he obeys all that inner adesh that was coming to him. So, he immediately left. And from there, the next message was, go to Pondicherry. You know why? Yeah, it was... Yeah, it was a French colony, it was safer, the British could not touch him. So, he left for Pondicherry, where you are now. 